Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Kate Steyer, and I am the Alumni Affairs Manager at SVA. Um, and I am very excited to present our discussion tonight. Uh, let's talk curating your life in the arts. Um, tonight we have with us six very talented and accomplished SVA alumni. They're each at slightly different stages in their professional lives and they are all working in slightly different creative fields. But I think we're gonna see quite a few common themes emerge as they talk about how they've navigated their lives and, and uh, careers in the arts and how they've made their way to where they are now. Um, as a reminder to all of the alumni in the audience tonight, um, we're gonna be having a uh, private reception in the lobby um, following the discussion, so I hope you'll all stay and join us for that. So um, allow me to introduce you to all of our panelists tonight. We'll get started with Scott Bacall. Um, Scott earned his BFA in illustration in 1993 and is now an award-winning illustrator who has had work included in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Variety, and over 100 other publications and media. Uh, he previously served on the Society of Illustrators Board of Directors, and he is currently an associate professor at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Next, we have Jenny Morgan, who received her MFA in Fine Arts in 2008 and is an artist living and working here in New York. Her work is shown in solo exhibitions in New York, Colorado, Utah, and Indiana. And she has also shown in numerous group exhibitions across the United States, as well as internationally in England and Sweden. She is currently represented by Driscoll Babcock Gallery here in New York. Uh, Kate Neckel uh, earned her MFA in computer art in 2002, and she now works as an artist and designer whose clients have included Vogue, Vanity Fair, In Style, Wild Air Restaurant, and Cafe Grumpy. She has created murals for Hudson Studios, Chelsea Day School, and the Ace Hotel, and recently published her first book, Start Now, The Creativity Journal, with Chronicle Books. Vincent Payone received his BFA in film and video in 2007, and has gone on to become an award-winning commercial and narrative film director. After graduating from SVA, he worked for seven years at collegehumor.com, where he helped build the original content department. He is currently developing a tev television show with Comedy Central and recently completed his first short stop motion animated film, The Sea is Blue, for YouTube's Field Day channel. Annie Watt received her BFA in Media Arts in 1974 and has since worked extensively as a society event photographer in New York City, the Hamptons, Beverly Hills, and Palm Beach. As a contributing photographer for Condé Nast, Hearst Magazines, and New York Social Diary, her work has been featured in Town and Country and Elle Decor, among many others. In 2015, she established her very own event photography agency. And last but not least, Heidi Zito earned her MFA in photography, video, and related media in 2012, and now works as a visual designer by day and a fine artist by night. Her work has been featured in O Magazine, People Magazine, Refinery29, and the Huffington Post, and she is shown in two solo exhibitions in New York. In search of the perfect balance between career, creative passions, and personal happiness, she maintains a studio in Brooklyn where she paints and explores a variety of creative endeavors. I would also like to introduce you to our moderator tonight, Jane Nuzzo who is SVA's Director of Alumni Affairs and Development. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming tonight's alumni panel. And I'll turn it over to you, Jane. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to our audience for being here. And of course, thank you to our phenomenal panel of alumni. We are so thrilled to have you with us this evening. Um, so let's talk. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking each of you to first bring us up to date. Um, Scott, we'll start with you at the end and we'll just work on down the line. Please briefly tell us about one new thing or project you're currently working on um, that hopefully excites you. Oh, man. Uh, I, 
I have a lot of things happening at once. Um, I, I'm doing a new series of that guy back there, a uh, Dim Stars series. It's uh, mostly for gallery, fine arts, maybe. Um, going to be working on a graphic novel over the summer with it. I've started making plans for that. So that's one particular project that's sort of outside commercial, my normal commercial work. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I'm currently working on a body of work for uh, my first solo show in London that opens March 24th. Great. What's up? Hi. <laughs> it's kind of weird <laughs> to be on a microphone. Um, I'm working on ideas for my second book and um, producing a video for the band Honduras with my husband and um, developing an app that I can't really talk about yet, but it's kind of cool to mix it up. Uh, my, I guess the next thing I'm working on is uh, the third season of a show with Two Chains, the rapper for GQ, one of the producers in the room, uh, and I hope he uh, knows my name this time. <laughs> um, as the introduction was, I started an agency in January this year. Uh, one of my competitors started his about four years ago, and he made $7 million last year. So I was motivated to start my own. <laughs> Um, I'm working on a, a couple things. Um, on the art side, I'm working on a new series of paintings, which is a continuation of In the Trees, um, which is about my personal uh, memories and experiences. And for design, I'm, I'm currently working um, on retail, high-end retail packaging for a health and wellness brand. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the theme for this evening, each of you has very successfully forged what I believe are very meaningful creative careers. Um, but of course, this did not happen overnight for any of you. Um, Scott, you have said that it took 12 to 13 years for you to be paid attention to as an illustrator. Annie, um, you originally were um, advised to be a career recruiter, then interned as a private investigator. Um, ended up taking a forensic photography class, which ultimately led you into photography. Jenny, you have actually shared that you were blessed to be able to navigate the gallery system. Vince, you blazed a path that really began as a student and was followed by your seven-year stint working at College Humor and where that's led you. Kate, at the beginning, you said you were not even confident enough to declare yourself as a studio major, so we're studying art history. And finally, Heidi, after graduating from SVA, you said you needed to find a way to make money immediately. Um, so with that said, uh, take us back. When you finished your degrees, and, and all of you have multiple, um, I believe most of you have multiple degrees, um, so you can speak just to your general experience. How did you determine what your next steps would be? And I throw this out to any of you to start with. I've had the most jobs. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the oldest. <laughs> um, graduated in 1974. Yeah. As soon as I graduated, I was also looking for a job. I wanted to make money, too. And Barbizon School of Modeling hired me as their agency director. I was their youngest director. And I called a magazine, got an art director on the phone, and he was an SVA graduate, too. And I said, listen, I have models that aren't experienced. He said, I have a budget that is zero. I went, great, let's work together. <laughs> and I realized it wasn't what you knew, it was who you knew. So I started looking into who else graduated from SBA that can help me. Mm -hmm. And along the way, tried to find people that would help, changed careers a number of times, always making sure that what I did was interesting to me. Um, the private investigation was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting. And, but the forensic photography was more interesting. But it lent itself well to, you know, go and shoot something and then turn in images to court and the photos have to tell a story. And when I became an event photographer, the editor said, you tell a nice story. And I said, yeah, that's what the judge said. <laughs> uh, Vincent, you had said something about storytelling when we spoke. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, actually, to your point, you know, I think uh, l luck 
factors into it, you know, in, in that you, you happen to run across somebody who is uh, an SBA grad, right? Yeah. Um, I guess when, uh, when, I, when I was first approached by College Humor, then College Humor, uh, I didn't even know what it was. And, you know, I, I was lucky that they had found my clips on YouTube and they said, hey, do you want to do what you are doing with your friends anyway and come do it with us? And I thought that was exciting because they were going to pay me. Uh, so, um, you know, and then and as College Humor evolved, um, to a considerable extent, I played a part in that. But it was a lot. There was a lot of luck in in the fact that uh, I was I was a part of this machine that was was gaining momentum and was at the you know happening at the right time for the internet. The internet was ready for it to happen. So. It was like a lot of uh, a lot of timing things that that didn't answer your question at all. <laughs> That's okay. It's um, it's an open <laughs> forum here, so. No, yeah. Um, Would anyone else like to speak to that kind of that starting off point? Um, um, I was just going to say that when I got out of SVA, I had a couple of different jobs. One of them was working at the now defunct Chelsea Art Museum. It's not around anymore, but. Um, one of the parties that I hosted was a thing for Nike, and it turns out that one of the guys that was um, putting the party on ended up being the one of the owners of the Ace Hotel. And so I was kind of working this job that wasn't my dream job. You know, many years later, I run in, I'm sitting in the now, you know, the Ace Hotel lobby, and I say, oh my gosh, I remember this guy from, you know, five years ago when I was working that museum job. It was Alex Calderwood from the Ace Hotel. Hello, I'm Kate. Remember me? Can I please draw on your walls? And that's that was the evolution of it. So you just never know, even if it's not your dream job right away or the most exciting thing. Keep your eyes open and you know be open to who. Be nice. Be nice, you know, because you never know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Jenny. Uh, when I graduated from SVA, I was fortunate enough to have um, Marilyn Minter as a teacher, and she took me on as an assistant right after I graduated, which was amazing to see her practice and how she um, set up the business side and to watch her have studio visits with her gallerists and the way that she conducted herself and um, the sense of power that she had when, if it, when inside of all of that, and being inside of her um, Soho loft that she's had since the 70s, uh, that she pays like $1,000 for, it's insane. <laughs> um, so it was a real gift to be able to see an established artist set up their whole system and, and work with seven other painters, and to make someone else's work for four years was really interesting, so. Yeah. Uh, Scott. Jeez. Uh, when I graduated, every, I mean, there's like two halves of my career. One is the analog half, and then like I guess from like 1998 on, uh, internet and websites and all that sort of stuff happened. Um, so that's kind of how I break down my career. And the first half was essentially just a long series of failures, 90% failing all the time, not getting enough work, not being able to afford to promote, all that sort of stuff. Um, because prior to getting a computer, I mean, you actually had to mail things and that cost money and print things, which were much more costly. Um, but I, I think it, what it was is every once in a while there'd be those little successes along the way and eventually those sort of add up and people start paying attention to those successes as you go along. Um, was there... I guess like the first really big change was probably around 2006 where I, you know, uh, I actually started entering competitions and uh, putting myself out there in a volunteer way. I started volunteering at certain places and everything to get to actually know people, networking, you know, being nice to people, that sort of thing. And that first competition, I won like silver medals and got loads of work in and that just all of a sudden people started seeing that and more calls started coming in you know great yeah sorry no 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 that's great and 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 circling back Heidi um you know to this idea of when you graduated from SVA and you know I've got to find a way to make money you've 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 found um you know this this balance that um yeah in, in your work I mean I don't think it's an uncommon thought I mean I, when I graduated SVA, I didn't really know what I was going to do. 
I know that immediately I needed money and to find a job um, because I had uh, two goals. One was to pay rent and pay my student loans. Um, and I also really wanted a studio. Um, SVA provided me a studio in Chelsea, which was fantastic. And I just couldn't ma imagine myself without one because that would mean you know, I would not be able to paint. Um, so I was able to land uh, a job at a small video production house um, and do animation and video projects there. That's where it all started. <laughs> Great. Um, That's sort of horrific, actually. Uh, like, like <laughs> actually, what, what year did you graduate again? Uh, 2012. 2012. Yeah. Like when I graduated, my rent was 300 bucks a month. Oh my God, that's, you know, that was my S rent in Florida. <laughs> SBA, my last year's tuition was 11000 for the entire year. You know, so, yeah, I wasn't, you know, making a lot of money, but uh -huh. it wasn't, I mean, yeah, I was poor. I had a hard time feeding yeah. myself. But your situation, that's what, you know, when you say, I need money, you yeah. do really need it's money. even hard on private investigators nowadays yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a it's a different different world yeah. um, you know I think New York City full stop and um, you know and, and I do we will get to talking about living in New York versus other locations um, it, just sticking with the beginnings a little bit um, all of you spoke about an experience from you know either your childhood or early adult young adult life um, and one thing that really came across from all of you is that you really were encouraged at an early age and really had, had a positive support system from what I gleaned. Um, you don't have to share those individual stories, but if you want to speak to that a little bit, because I think when you're forging a career in the arts without that kind of support, it can be really difficult. So anyone want to? Jump I'll, in on that. I'll say it's definitely hard to feel successful if you're not being validated in some way. Um, and that gets old pretty quick, you know, if you know you're doing the wrong thing. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, it could, it could be in there somewhere buried, you know. Um, I think for, for artists specifically, I just, I don't know if you guys would agree, but I just don't feel like there's any other option. It's just this is what I have to do and there's, you know, um, and where did that come from? You know, there are definitely memories you could try to trace it back to, but if it's there, you know, it, in some ways I, I, feel, I feel bad for people who don't quite know what they want to do um, because I, I feel lucky in that I know what I want to do. And if you know what you want to do, you, you can just keep doing it and eventually it has to go well, right? So, Jenny, if you're willing, I would like to ask you to share your story because I, I think it it speaks to something, not just in terms of what your personal experience was, but what that translated into for your success today. Yeah, um, so uh, I, when people ask me why I'm, I'm an artist, I always, it always kind of takes me aback, because I'm like, well, because there was never any other option. Um, and I remember always drawing and creating, and in fourth grade, I had this small project where I was cutting up a piece of cardboard, and like making all these weird pizza shapes or whatever. So I kind of did that for a month and then got over it and threw them away. And my dad came home and saw them in the garbage and took them out and then brought them to me and said, you can't throw these away because they have value. And he took me to a frame shop and framed them wow. and <laughs> put them on the wall. And it's not until like as an adult looking back at that, realizing how profound that validation was and it's, I mean, I, I have friends who did not receive that from their families, and I watch them as adults struggle to find that anchor. Um, and I, I do think the people who are successful are the ones who really feel like they have no other choice. Great. And I brought with me <laughs> my validation. My mother saved <laughs> illustrations that were of me by a boy that was 12. They used to make fun of me by drawing pictures. And I, I just said, I've got to be an artist too. He's drawing me, I'm drawing him. I have no idea what he's doing now. I, I think his name's Bill. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. But I said, I can draw, but it's faster to take pictures. Right. So I think I'll take pictures. And I was always giving photos as gifts. If you invite me for dinner, I'm gonna take a picture of your dog. And you're gonna get a thank you for dinner, here's a picture of your dog. Um, and I still do that. <laughs> I have to take pictures. I have to. 
and whether someone pays me or not. I gave a photo away to a woman because I thought, this is beautiful. It's the nicest picture I ever took. And you have to have it. So she emailed me back and said, um, I just donated $25 million, and I'd like to use your picture for the cover of the magazine. They want to do a story about me. And I said, well, if you can donate $25 million, I'll donate the photo. <laughs> People ask me, you know, well, what else do you do? You're a photographer. What do you do to make money? It's like, well, no, I, I make money now. <laughs> <laughs> if you keep sticking at and doing what you love, people eventually pay you because you love it so much that people want you to keep doing it. And I didn't pick being a photographer. It picked me. And I didn't pick making a living at this. It picked me. I picked opening an agency, though. Anyone else in terms of early influences? Uh, my, my mom was very, like, here's paper from work and all that sort of stuff until I actually decided to go to college for it. And that's where <laughs> things sort of changed. Uh, I come from a blue collar family. The, the first time I entered a museum was in college when I went to SVA. Um, so I didn't really have too much of a background there. It was only years later on when it became sort of like, a, you know, social points on, you know, her, oh, look, my son's in the New York Times. Look at this. You know, it uh, becomes valuable to her then at that point, you know. Uh, but to kind of go off a little bit what Annie said, um, there, there was a couple of reasons. Like, I always drew. My mom saved all these things from first, second grade that I still have, which I love having still um, and uh, as I was growing up going through like high school and all that looking and working these part-time jobs I knew I did not want to live a certain life which meant no cubicles no you know no real sort of structure that somebody else is dictating to me um, that became really important to me uh, dictating how I want to live my life. Um, it's short. I don't want to be told what to do. So I just kind of stuck with it. And I draw. It's fun. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. How are your parents about it now? Um, my dad still wishes um, I was a bus driver. But, um, <laughs> you know, they were accepting. <laughs> That's good. Um, well, on that note, uh, I'm just going to pivot here. In regard to career challenges, you know, it's always easy. We can hone in on these successes, um, but a lot of mistakes are made throughout careers. And Scott, you've already um, touched on that a little bit. A couple of themes that emerged in my conversations with all of you include learning to trust your intuition and the mistake of spending time comparing yourself to others. Kate, you cited the importance of being able to take a leap of faith, which I think you've taken many in your career. Scott, you spoke of learning to say no. Um, and Annie and Vince, you both spoke of how comparing yourself to others can be detrimental. Um, <laughs> so again, you know, kind of with, with these themes in mind, can you speak to what you might consider the biggest mistake you've made in your career that you've learned from, or perhaps a significant challenge that you've faced um, that you've you've grown from. You go first. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's mine's kind of specific to the fine art world because um, in school I feel like I was always taught that to be a fine artist it means that you are unabashedly putting your whole self into these images and that you are not supposed to be swayed by outside opinion um, and it's supposed to be fully you. Um, and then that collides with the world of money and expectation. And I think the most recent challenge I've had is um, fully investing myself and then being told that that wasn't correct or that it wasn't financially viable because it was challenging. And it kind of shattered this perspective of I had of, about sincerity um, when it confronts uh, the financial aspect of it. So that's something I'm still kind of grappling with and, and learning to be wholly present in the work and protecting myself from that um, criticism. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges or mistakes that I've, I mean, I'm still constantly making mistakes, but 
when you're building your portfolio, you're, you know, you're out of college, you're out of grad school, and you're taking on clients, and you're trying to make money, and you're trying to, you know, like I said, build your portfolio, you have, um, and maybe you have an agent, or maybe you have whoever you have, a gallerist, and just building, um, building a name for yourself, you know, some people say building your brand, what have you, it's really important to um, follow your gut and follow what feels right to you, because people are going to say, oh, you got to take this client for this reason, or you got to, you know, and you have to realize that these things are going to live on the internet, they're not going to go away, and you're building yourself and your name and your, uh, you know, project by project. So I think that being mindful of what you uh, say yes to and um, being cool with saying no, you know, because it's so exciting to get that, you know, email or call saying, hey, so-and-so wants to work with you, you know. It's hard to say no, but it's important to um, build, not, you know, to build your, uh, your identity, being uh, thoughtful. I had a period of time where I couldn't say no. My mother was sick, the nurse charged 150 a day, and I took any job at any price. And I tried to find myself in jobs I hated. And I tried to be creative in, and enjoy people I hated and, and just look for the joy. Beca and what came out of that was a learned experience of, I never would have taken this job if I was my snobby self, which is so easy to be. <laughs> but, oh really, you have no idea. Um, <laughs> But because I wanted to make sure the nurse was there and paid, I took anything at any price and I made it work. And if you have the attitude that you're going to make it work and you're going to find a reason to be there, a better reason to be there, you get to explore a different part of yourself that, you know, I'm back though to being my snobby self. <laughs> Scott, you ha you've got some thoughts on this theme, I think. So I. Um, you talked about some difficult times where at a certain point you even stopped illustrating for a year. Yeah, that was me just sort of um, circling the wagons and trying to, it was that sort of mid-career, you know, um, freak out, I guess. You know, things weren't working, what was I doing wrong, and instead of throwing darts at a board blindly is just kind of step back and restart everything. What, are, what failed over the last six, you know, seven, eight years, that sort of thing. Um, but as, as far as um, a, f a mistake, is that sort of the original yeah, question? Yeah, challenge, mistake. Um, I th it, my, my answer to that is a little bit more philosophical, which is um, uh, my mistake is being fearful. Um, and, I've made business mistakes and all that, and you know that goes away. You know, it's those those sorts of bad moves, or maybe you rub somebody the wrong way once in a while. That happens. You try to fix it, uh, and all that. But uh, I think fear is what prevents you from succeeding because um, it, it could lead to insecurities, or my work isn't good enough. Should I do that? Am I saying the right things? Um, uh, trusting yourself, I think is important and when I discovered that when I sort of made that self-realization during around that time as well um, things got easier um, I was able to connect with more people that way I was um, you know instead of waiting for an exhibition or waiting for a job just email or call them and say can I can I have an exhibition there can I be part of a show can I do these sorts of things you know and believe it or not, I, I, it even shocked me when people said yeah sure you know why not um, so when when I tried it out a few times and I saw that it was working um, I try to make sure I don't fall back into that mistake of being fearful again I agree mm -hmm. yeah I agree also <laughs> I just wanted to add to what yeah. Scott said so eloquently that, you know, it's so easy to get stuck. Like you're, it's, it's in a lot of ways abstract when you're, in, when you're creating things, you know, and I, there, there are many, many times where I've like said to myself, oh, well, I need to be more like that guy, you know, like that guy's crushing it or that girl's killing it. Like, I really want to be doing that. But 
it, it stops you from making your own stuff, which is so debilitating. And I, a quote that I heard that made a lot of sense to me was, um, even the best unfinished script is still not as good as the worst finished script. So that was like, oh yeah, so you do have to get to the end at least, even if it's bad, you know, you can at least go back and have something to work with in some way. Um, yeah, so take that chance. I'd love to add to Scott and Vincent's point. Um, one of my biggest mistakes I feel or challenges is that uh, I don't put myself out there enough because um, I'm shy or fearful. Um, and it, there's uh, a, a comfort to having a studio and being close to, to the friends that I know best. And um, I think I'm realizing now that it's really important to have a balance of making work and putting yourself out there. Um, and if you're not doing one, you should be doing the other. Great, thank you all. Um, so talking about finding balance, <laughs> um, as creative individuals, certainly motivation can come and go. Uh, you've touched on the need to find balance, um, the importance of remaining open to opportunity. Um, Jenny, you also spoke of something that I think is really interesting to talk about, which is the importance of self-care. Um, I think you said the work suffers if you are not taking care of yourself. Um, and again, Scott, I think you even said uh, you actually can get bored with your work and change up your illustration style, sometimes to your own detriment, to, um, you know, in terms of the, the business of what you do. Um, in terms of, you know, I'm now going to just throw a more general question out to you along these lines. How do you manage the ebb and flow of your work, both psychologically and if you want to touch on it financially? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the financial implications as creative professionals, but, you know, how, how do you... How do you manage that ebb and flow? Um, and perhaps where do you find your inspiration? How do you keep motivated? I bought a book. And in the front of the book were a list of things that I needed to do. But in the back of the book were projects that I wanted to do, big, big projects. And every time I get inspired, I put the big projects here and then how to do the projects here. And when I'm bored, I look at my own notes and I start grabbing my own projects that I know I need to do. My next project, I'm going to be shooting military-themed photos and donating 100% of the proceeds to a military organization. Um, you just, you don't have to do something because it's going to put money in your pocket, but you do have to do something to stay creative. And so you give yourself the assignment. And you can call a magazine and give them the whole thing and say, here, this is for you to publish, and they'll publish it, especially if you don't ask them for any money. Um, but what you learn f about yourself when you're doing a, a project is so much more creative than when you are paid to do what somebody else is paying you to do, that you can, you're not wrong because you're doing it yourself. Whereas when you're working for a client, uh, they, they have their input. They tell you what they want. You do it yourself, you do it yourself. And so I say you've got to have a good balance of, of projects that you want to do just for you and projects that you have to do to pay the bills. Um, I, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm very visual, and I, used to, I remember w I would look at my inbox, and you know I would say, well, oh, this email that came in, this is like in my head, I would say that's a them email, and this is a me email. And they relate to things that I'm excited about. And I think if you keep the, the machine running where the, the you emails keep coming in, you know, the them emails have to happen because you have to make money. But if the you emails are coming in or however you like to work, I'm using email as my reference. But eventually, you know, it gets a little blurrier. And it's like, oh, well, these are all kind of me emails because they like what I'm doing separately. And that's my voice, and that's what people are paying you for in the end, is having a very distinct POV of what you are interested in and want to be doing. And that's what is attractive about you as, as someone that wants to be hired. Yeah, I totally agree. I find that um, I used to see things kind of separately, and then now it's my kind of thing is to go into a space, whether it's the ACE or 
you know, doing things with Kohan and being open to the space and being open to um, giving my vibe and my perspective of how I feel about something. You know, it's all about feeling and being open and then kind of translating um, the brand or the client or whoever you're working with. But I think you're really right. Um, it all kind of becomes one thing. And um, yes, you have to nourish yourself with, you know, films that you like or books and, you know, getting out to see music or even for me, you know, bites of food from what my friends are cooking at Wild Air or something. You have to nourish yourself and you have to, you know, take care of yourself. When I was growing up, I had this idea, you know, I'd read about Basquiat or these artists in New York, and you're like, oh, it's so, you know, punk rock and you have to live so hard. And it's not true. You have to take care of yourself. You know, you have to eat well, you have to exercise, you have to sleep. I take so many naps when I can, and naps are where my ideas come. Like, the ideas come when you just rest and you chill, and I try and meditate, and it's so important. Because and a lot of the work is very physical and time consuming. You have to be good to yourself. That's great, Jenny. Can you hit on that too? Because you had spoke about that specifically. Yeah, and while we were talking about that, it was more like I was kind of lying through my teeth because I haven't been practicing that. So I <laughs> I go through those phases of being kind of like that romantic, like suffering artist, where I get to this place where I my primary boss is a deadline, and so I. I uh, can go to my studio every day and I construct my life however I want to, but within that is um, the workaholism that really takes over, and so I do have to remind myself to eat. Like, as funny, as simple as that sounds, you know, like I have to like force myself to sit down and eat, and I need to remind myself that I need to be social because I spend a lot of time by myself <laughs> every day, and that's very interesting, and I go on a lot of journeys and inward journeys that show through the work, but at the same time, it can go to some dark places if I'm not taking care of myself. So, yeah. Uh, I find balance in bottles of wine. <laughs> um, after, <laughs> um, b illustrating for 20 years now, like it, it's been such a, it becomes just the thing. Like it, it ends up being that job in a cubicle. Uh, because you're doing it over and over again. I mean, each job is different. There's a different concept. There's a different thought. There's a different article to read about whatever culture or societal thing that's going on. Um, but uh, what I've started doing over the last maybe seven or eight years is, you know, like that guy, which is completely free of that. Um, I've started... Um, doing photography, you know, even on a professional level now, uh, doing some personal short films and documentaries, things like that. Um, because uh, I, I think Vince said, you know, he's a visual person. I mean, I'm, there's all these neat things that are out there that still need to be kind of tossed up and thrown into the juggling match of life as an artist, I guess. It's sort of a cheesy way of saying it. But, um, you know, the bal I mean, work balance versus finding that inner peace, meditation. I go to the gym two to three days a week myself just to, you know, run it off, as, as it were. But um, th throughout the year, I, and especially maybe July or August, I'll take a, a solid month off. Like, I'll just stop everything. Uh, because the rest of the year are it's incredibly hectic. Taught a class last night on a train here, leaving tomorrow, flying to London on Friday, going to be in Dublin, then flying to Syracuse when I come back from there. You know, so there's like, and on top of that, doing that work, the photo jobs lined up, et cetera. You know, so um, it's like, you know, wine. That's what, that's what you end up with is wine until you can get that break on a beach somewhere or something and where you could kind of level off and then reevaluate. That's kind of how I operate. It's just like tackle everything for a few months and then reevaluate. You know? And get drunk. And get, you know, well. My doctor said, asked me if I responsibly. smoked. Responsibly. Yeah. My doctor asked me if I smoked. I said, no. He goes, do you drink? I went, only at work. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a full-time um, designer, so... The ebb and flow for financial is, isn't that much, but uh, for creativity, I, I you know, it, having a full-time job gives me a routine that is really valuable to me. Um, 
you know, I, I have to uh, be at the office from 10 to 6, and that forces me to prioritize my time um, and, uh, and what I want to do. And so I make it uh, an effort to go to the studio every day, and sometimes I'm trudging through the snow uh, to go to my studio. It's like seven minutes away from where I live in Brooklyn, um, and sometimes I'm doing it at night. Um, it's exhausting because I feel like I'm working, you know, overtime, um, but at the same time, it's, it's really rewarding. Um, and to Scott's point, um, yeah, I mean, having a routine is, will, you know, it, it, you're able to, excuse me, so I think that you're, if you're, um, sorry guys, <laughs> um, once you fall into uh, sort of like a block, it's not uh, as detrimental if because I'm working as a full time designer, right? right? right. So um, that really helps. But I think, yeah, having a routine is the most important thing to me and my creativity. Mm. Thank you. So we've touched on this a little bit, but um, in part per this evening's presentation. Um, an audience of, um, of alumni, and we're going to be all gathering at the reception afterward. I want to talk a little bit about networking. Um, and, you know, again, you guys have already touched on these themes of relationships and how critical they are. Um, and I'm going to just throw this out there. You know, Vince and Annie, I think as individuals, you are both like the very classic extroverts. You guys, um, you know, are also in fields that are either collaborative and or demand a lot of interaction with a lot of people. So. Um, having met you, that seems like a natural fit. Heidi, at the other end of the spectrum, um, you have very candidly shared that by your nature, you're an introvert and a very shy person um, and have had to work hard to continue to overcome that shyness. Um, so kind of like from these two ends of, of the networking spectrum, I, I want to I kind of hate the word networking, you know, like it's such a buzzword. So I'm just going to say, like, I, I really, I, I hate it, but we do kind of have to use it because we want to present, you know, this in a way so that people feel like there's some kind of value in this. Um, but I think what it really is about in, in my time at SVA meeting alumni, it's about building relationships. Um, and I'm going to just throw it to you, Vince, um, specifically. I, I do think in your field, it's like you talked a little bit about how these relationships develop, and I, I think all of you probably have different relationships that you know not only grew out of SBA, but obviously in your world, and but how crucial that is to your success. Sure. Um, yeah, filmmaking is very collaborative, um, which is why I said be nice. <laughs> um, you know, there was a long time I was in school. I remember thinking, like, you know, who do I who do I love? Like, oh, I love. Tarantino or whatever, well, I need to get in with him, but it was really people next to me that I needed to get in good with, because they were the people that were actually gonna help me mm. make a film. It wasn't gonna be Tarantino. He wasn't gonna donate his time. <laughs> um, you know, and I, in comedy specifically, I mean, I loved comedy, uh, and I would, on my leisure time, go see shows at Upright Citizens Brigade to relax. Now I do so much comedy that I have to watch like alligator attack videos to relax. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was like just what you do. So I would go and and see shows and hang out with people and uh, bitch about the PBR price, you know. And then and all these like great friendships came out of it. And these were people, you know, stand ups and people who, you know, couldn't afford dinner. Buddies like Ben Schwartz and like Aubrey Plaza and Donald Glover and all these people that have gone on to make great careers for themselves. And you know, as they they've grown in their career, hopefully, so have you. And they're still also a phone call away. And when you're making a commercial, you know, it's it's easy to write them and and as a friend, be like, do you want to do this thing? Like, do you want to do the thing? Like, yeah, do the thing. And everybody's ended and you know ends up happy about it because it's like pay, getting paid to hang out again. Right. Um, so like, I guess my story is just all luck, complete. And utter. Um, but you know, if, if if you kind of make yourself a part of a, a world, um, you know, then you're, you're you're in that world, and you can um, 
there are benefits to being a part of a community that succeeds together. Right. So, Kate, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, definitely at SVA, um, two things. One, my video teacher, I think I was taking a sound class and video class me with Jared Lauder, and one day after class he was like, hey, you know, um, this guy David Byrne is looking for an art assistant and, you know, maybe you'd be interested in helping him or, you know, working for him. And yes, of course, great. And uh, so teachers are amazing uh, sources of jobs, you know, uh, and opportunities. But then also just your friends. When I had to leave the job um, with David, one of my fellow classmates said, hey, I'm working at this new little startup magazine and um, you should come work with us. And it ended up being this kind of like mini Warhol factory of, you know, Zach Posen and Jemima Kirk and Theo Wenner and all these kids now who have become um, names for themselves. But, you know, that's, I was filming them and I was hanging out with them and um, it was just this organic, now your friends and your, like you're saying, the people that you're just hanging with are your future collaborators. And, you're, you know, now the footage that I shot at SVA during that time is being used for this documentary that's being made about Zach now. And it's just very interesting how, like you said, okay, you know, oh, I love Sofia Coppola or who would I want to work with? But really the people that are going to be working with you and that you're going to be making stuff with are your homies in Quentin class right Tarantino. now. Yeah. <laughs> it's your, it's your, uh, it's the people right around you, right. teachers, classmates. That's it. Any, anyone else on? I, I just have to echo the statement. I feel like uh, the word networking for me always sounded like you would be that person that would go to an opening and like hand out your business card to everyone, which <laughs> doesn't help at all. Like it, that, it's very rare that that does anything for anyone. So it really is about um, relying on your natural friend group and everything that is naturally organic. And it may be them or it may be a family member that gets a job at this place and then, you know, so it really is kind of about your, your organic network. Annie? I did a lot of things free. I would call organizations and ask them if they'd like me to photograph it and I'd give them the photos. I would just talk to people that I thought might need photography and since I want to do it anyway, I'd rather be shooting than be at home not shooting. So if they didn't pay me, I didn't care. I just wanted to make sure I did it every day. Every day. And the fellow that wrote the book, you know, Humans of New York, that was his philosophy too interview six people a day and put it on the internet, have 10,000 people put together a book. Well, it turned into something completely different than what he initially wanted to do. And for me, the same thing. I just wanted to shoot things. And so I didn't care if I got paid or not. And I guess that's a true artist because even now I forget to invoice people. <laughs> so. I always jokingly say, well, you're ruining my starving artist status by trying to pay me, uh, but go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I think, but I'm more like Jenny. I, I will sit at home and, and not socialize and, and remind myself I have to socialize with people. Instead, I use my camera as a way to socialize. You know, I'll get invited to a baby shower because I want to shoot the baby shower and give the mother-to-be some photos. And if they then hire me in the future, fine. If they don't, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to jump to um, another question, you know, kind of in the same vein. Uh, we all talked a little bit about living in New York and, you know, SBAs in New York. Um, all of you have lived in New York. Currently, Scott, you have been living in Boston for several years. Kate, I'm here. you're here right now. Um, uh, I was in Seattle for a minute when we talked. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the importance of being in New York, does, does, that, does that factor in for all of you? Or, you know, if you could, would you get out? Um, well, I always feel bad saying yes because it is hard to live in the city. But um, I do think that there's an energy and a pulse and a forward movement here that doesn't exist in a lot of other places. Um, this is where people come to 
be a part of that. And it's also a place, it's a city that supports the arts in a bigger way than a lot of other cities that I've lived in or been a part of. Um, so I, I feel bad saying yes, but I, I personally believe that this is the best place to be. Yeah, and I think the kind of opportunities that can happen here, um, like how you can be one morning at my kid's school, you know, a mom texts me saying, oh, do you mind, and I gave a stylist, you know, at this company your email address or your website, and then by that afternoon, the whole art department and a set crews and my apartment, and overnight, it's the Cole Hong campaign, and things can happen in New York like they can't happen anywhere else. You know, the girl you're doing yoga next to is the person that's saying, oh, by the way, I'm making this book, you know, just, there's nothing, there's no other place like it. Right. I no, no, it. no, no, yeah. it's, I mean, it's, I, I think it, it's a factor because, you know, we talk about the cost of living and, but, you know, and then just to hear a different opinion, you know, Scott, talk a little bit about your, your feelings now that you're up in Boston. Um, well, for what I do, New York is certainly like the hub, uh, publishing, all that sort of thing, magazines. Uh, there's certainly more here than most other places in the country. So um, being here for that uh, was wonderful, you know. Um, and, you know, you meet somebody the, that one time, they recognize your face, you know, they see, oh, he's not nuts, I'll hire him, you know, the, that, that works out. Um, Boston is actually quite an artistic city. Uh, the arts are really highly regarded there, which is, which is really nice to discover. Um, the problem is, is that it's a smaller a much smaller version of New York. So uh, the artists who've been born there, grew up there, they're, they're a little bit more diverse in the jobs that they do because uh, the potential of full-time living up there, working on your art, doesn't seem to be as, as much as it would be here. You know, so uh, if, if, you know, if people really want to reach a next level, they end up coming to New York anyways. You know, it's so, like, so, for so many years up in Boston, I heard, you know, trying to reinvigorate the arts, get more arts in there, but there's just isn't, like, as far as galleries, there just isn't enough collectors enough. There, there isn't that mass. Bands, you know, bands, yeah, they get popular in Boston, they start there, but then they leave. You know, they, right. they have to move on uh, in order to reach, um, uh, I hate to use that, but next level right. uh, sort of thing. So personally, me leaving here with as much, as active as I was here, um, being board directors and going to all the parties and openings here, to moving to Boston, the first three years I was up there, I was coming back every couple of months regularly. Uh, the last three years, this is actually my first time back in New York City in three years. Um, today, which is um, kind of interesting. It's fun, it's like home. But um, I did still notice, raining. Still, raining. <laughs> still raining, yeah. Um, the, the, I have noticed a drop off because I haven't been able to be there and meet people and all that sort of stuff because that was sort of my way of life at that point. Um, to, go, to go back a little bit to like the networking thing, like you know, the way Vince is, like, you, when you create your work, it, like, the entire job is sort of collaborative. Like, you need to collaborate in order to create the piece. I deal with one other person, often, the art director, and oftentimes I'm just left to my own devices. Anyways, read the article, come up with something. So it is very isolating, and, and I have, that's sort of part of my personality. Like, I like being alone, I don't like dealing with people, but then, <laughs> you know, uh, the next month, all I want to do is go to parties and meet people and all that sort of stuff. So I definitely have a back and forth. You know, I, I actually, uh, like Annie and, and, and Vince, I'm impressed. Like, you could see it in how they act. You know, like, you guys walk into a room, you're there, and, you know, you, you can connect with people quite easily. Um, I'm just a little weird. I can't do that <laughs> as well, you know. Well, we're, we're happy to have you in New York tonight. Um, My girlfriend wants me to talk less. Ah, I see. <laughs> um, so I want to just hit on one final um, kind of bigger theme that we've talked about uh, in our preliminary conversations. 
Each of you in one way or another maintains an active presence online, either through your website and or um, social media. Um, Scott, you've talked about uh, missing the pre-social media era. I think you called it the phone era. Mm. Um, but that the internet nonetheless has provided a great way to get work in front of people. Uh, Jenny, you actually shared a really interesting point of view. Um, you know, I'm always thinking in terms of social media as like a marketing tool from a career standpoint, but you spoke about the importance of social media because you spend a lot of time alone in the studio. You engage actively and with interest with it as a window to the outside world. Um, and Annie, you spoke about happily consulting a 12 year old as needed to keep up with the technology, you know, having uh, launched your recent venture. I know you have a whole new online presence. I've so. got a 16 year old and a 12 year old. Yes, all these people. I <laughs> when I went to school here, there, wasn't, there weren't computers, you know, there wasn't <laughs> computer science as a major. And so the idea of going to SVA and learning a lot, I had to learn a whole new set of skills when it came to digital photography and now social media, and I stay as current as I possibly can while I'm still trying to make a living, you know, with, with all that. And I went to a breakfast yesterday to learn more about social media, because I thought we were gonna talk about it. Um, but I, I have questions for anybody in the audience that is a photography major, or, or really anyone that's thinking of putting images on Instagram, knowing that now Google and Instagram, you know, they own your photos. They own your images. And so... We could have a whole other panel just about that. Exactly, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm still not on Instagram because of that. Right. And when I do put things on Facebook, I'm very careful to know that I don't own that image anymore. So I have to be careful what I put out there. Right, right. So, and Vince, can you talk to that? I mean, you're, like, a, a lot of your career is built on online. The internet has changed for sure since I started because I remember it used to be um, kind of like a secret and I think if people f stumbled upon your secret then they were like wow I, you know for me because I went to film school and I had aspirations to become a filmmaker I still do um, but you know I was I was putting my heart and my uh, weekly equipment rental from SVA into these web videos that you know, the, the thing that I kept hearing at the time was people being like, wow, I can't believe you made that for the internet. You know, and it was like, well, yeah, I mean, it, people are seeing it, so that's enough for me. And now I think it's like you have to, it's more about trends that you have to follow um, to stay up with what's going on because it's so widely accepted. Um, but I, to a considerable extent, I think it's, I, I'm not so nervous about putting things up and out there because I make things for people. But I, I also completely respect and appreciate that it's like, well, if you want this, you have to pay for it. Um, but, you know, for I me... I still want them to own it. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, totally. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm still in the phase of, like, I, I, I'm, I try to churn out so much work that I, I, I think I'm not defensive about it. And the idea of people um, seeing it is what, in addition to me being paid for it sometimes, is, like, enough for me. And I'd rather be seen more than hoard it. Um, so I don't really think about like who owns it or anything. I mean, you're giving your, uh, your, your work an opportunity to be seen that wouldn't exist otherwise, and therefore, by putting it out there, you know, if someone's really interested in it enough to steal it, then somebody's probably really interested enough to track you down and open up opportunity for you. That's how I see it. And I, under, I appreciate that may not be popular. No, no, I, I mean, and Kate or Jenny, do you either, oh, Heidi, Heidi, yeah, please. Um, I don't do that much social media, but I have a active website and portfolio, and I, I really try to update as much as possible because you never know who's going to, who, if you're going to meet someone who's going to stumble on your website, they could be potential buyers. Um, and the second thing, I, um, I have an active email list where I have uh, co collectors, potential collectors um, that I've collected over the years. And, um, you know, it's, it's been really good to me. Um, I prefer that type of outreach versus social media because it's a lot more personable. Um, and 
you know, I get to keep in touch with them. I send the emails probably once or twice a year, very limited, and just let them know things that are going on in my life um, and new works. And it's, it's really as simple as that. Right. Um, and that's helped uh, keep, you know, collectors uh, in touch for maybe like six, seven years now, and it's still growing. That's great. Yeah. Anyone else in, in that regard? Jenny? Yeah, um, I enjoy social media on a lot of different levels, and one is um, just watching uh, the networks of people and understanding the social dynamics that are happening. I listened to um, a This American Life podcast, I think it was This American Life, about uh, teenagers in high school and how the selfies are important in a certain way, and it's all about this um, social dynamic. And I think that that's true even in the art world, like understanding who's friends with who and who's connected to this curator and how that's structured. So that's a lot of how I use my social media. And I'm not so much worried about putting images out because I do have an original that is the thing of value. So I use Instagram uh, more as a way to show my brand, which is <laughs> what it's called, which is still interesting because it's just me, but um, yeah. dynamics in the studio and um, tidbits about what I'm interested in to kind of build an aura of who I am and what I'm working with. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's um, it was interesting for me because when I um, worked on my first book, I, I noticed that a lot of authors, you know, maybe they have these massive followings or they have, you know, a lot of... Uh, followers and I don't have that you know I have a handful I have whatever and um, clients I think realize people realize these things can be bought they can be manipulated they can be whatever I think that as long as you spend the right amount of time on the work like don't become f obsessed with m m this is how many followers I have or this is how many likes or this whatever you know I think that um, it's important and it has been important for me to be out there on social media I have a good time with it but um, I would say don't spend your energy getting too carried away with the amount of followers and getting into that whole game because from my experience, clients and people that I'm working with, they don't care about those things that much yeah, and, or as and much the, as I thought. The platforms shift so often. Yeah. Like I hardly interact with Facebook anymore. And so now it's more Instagram and then whatever, Snapchat, and now it's traveling. So they're, they're just kind of staying. I, I, I feel like it's going to keep changing sooner and faster the more we adapt to using technology in this way. So right. There's technology now. <laughs> <laughs> Quick anecdote about that. I was very early on, um, my buddy was like, hey, I use this um, blog that's way easier than WordPress called Tumblr. And, yeah. we, you know, this guy David runs it, and it's like, you know, he... So I was very early on hooked on Tumblr, I think like one of the first few hundred in New York um, where it started. And we were going to parties that were like at, uh, what was it, Black Cat, where it was, they were called meetups, you know, and it was really just a room full of people who thought they found this great secret, you know, and David Karp was coming up and saying, hey, I like your blog. And I was like, thanks. Um, so, and that's how it started. And, but it's funny now to look at it you know, with whatever success that that gets you or wherever that pushes you, it really means nothing now yeah. because Tumblr was bought by Yahoo and isn't cool anymore, so they say. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just funny. The platform is always going to be changing, and sure, it helps to make an impression, but it's also not the be-all, end-all. Yeah. I, I, I think social media and all that stuff is fascinating, um, I, and I love it. I love technology and computers. I'm just sort of a dork that way, and... Um, it, it is the way things are done now. Like part of my promotion, I guess, or whatever you call it, is still analog. I still send out printed books. I still send out postcards. I do all that sort of stuff, meeting people. But there is an aspect to the social media that has gotten me exhibitions. It has gotten me work. You know, never meeting them, just, oh, this, pers this art director friended me on Facebook. Okay, hey, do you want to do a job? You know, simple as that. Um, and it, it's, I, I just find it fascinating, like you kind of mentioned before, uh, I, I used to talk to illustrators on the phone while I was painting. You know, we just put on speakerphone and we'd chat. Um, to go from, I also feel a little cheated as well, like the year I graduated, 93, that was, I think SVA had three or four Apple computers, like they just got them in, like it was like, <laughs> 
this was the new thing. And I was already walking out the door. Like there was still advertising paste up mechanical artists. Mm -hmm. Like they still needed it for those people who know what that is. Um, you know, $15 an hour jobs, that sort of stuff. And then within, geez, um, I, I'd say somewhere around 96, between 96 and 2000, it was like this few years that everything just violently changed, you know. Um, and every, you know, I didn't FedEx paintings out anymore. I had to buy a scanner, you know, I had to do the production part myself now. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what glorious things have come out of it? You know, it's just really fantastic, you know, and keep it coming, you know, whoever is out there inventing shit, let's just keep it coming, that's great. There may be a panel on this stage someday where like, I graduated, no one had the chip implant. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, on that note, thank you all. I would like to take the opportunity to turn this over to audience Q&A. Um, we'll open up the discussion. If anybody has any questions, I'd like to ask you to um, step down at the bottom of the aisles. There's microphones on either side. And if you have a question for the panel, um, please please come down if you would like to ask any questions. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to repeat part of what you said. Um, so basically, the question is, how do you, looking at Scott's illustration as sort of a metaphor, um, have you put yourself out there? You're out in the dark, and how do you navigate your way through that? Is that um, what would anybody? Yes, yeah, Scott, please. I'll, that that painting is actually called the search. It actually is that. Um, uh, my best advice, I would, you know, never say do this or do that or anything like that. Um, and I wouldn't even call this advice, but, um, my perspective on like how, like those failures that I was mentioning to you about, that was me exactly in your position for five to 10 years after school where I knew, I, I knew there was the goal, which was, um, to get illustration work to get published, it, whatever. I, I was way open to everything. All I wanted to do was work with clients, they pay me money, I paint things for them. Um, and that's simple in concept, but the actual trying to get there, uh, that was fairly easy. You get one client, yay, you know, and you show mom and everything's great, but there's, there's the point of making the $500 job and feeling good about yourself, but then making enough of those 500 or thousand dollar jobs in order to actually l buy food and like actually live off of. That's that's the big key, you know part of that, um, and that's where all the failures came from because I kept trying this. I tried this sort of advertising resource. I tried doing that. I tried these exhibitions. I tried this promotion. I tried um, you know altering. You know, the first half of my career, I was, you know, thinking that I would alter my art to match a market. Um, you know, hey, that seems to be selling. Let me try that. Fail. Uh, and when I real when I stopped for that one year and decided to start making art that pleased me, the ideas that pleased me, uh, I'm guessing people saw the authenticity in that and started responding a little bit more. And, you know, with each failure, you go, okay, I'm not gonna do that again. And it's, hopefully pretty soon you'll start, you know, um, focusing exactly what you need to do because you're learning how to get to that point B or the point C as you go along. There, one of, one of the, the biggest questions I get is like, when you started out, how did you start promoting yourself? And all that, and it's like, well, that was 1993, and that, so it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, but it's, it's really different for everybody. Everybody has their own path. You know, my path was very, very specific, and, um, and you know, I, I, you know, other people, these guys, you know, had their own ways of getting to their point. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I think just, Stay true here and know what your your at least one goal is, and then just keep adding that, adding another goal as you reach the next one. 
something like that. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that, that's good. Thank you for yeah. speaking in the mic. Is this on? Okay, hi. Um, so I graduated from the photography department two years ago, and my biggest hurdle has been figuring out my studio space which I think, Heidi, you were really talking about. Like, I would go to the labs every day. Like, the photo building was my second home. And I guess figuring out how that translated to my personal life and my personal space has been my biggest challenge. Like, I've created a huge pin board in my bedroom, and that's my yeah. creative space. And I'm just wondering, like, how a few of you have dealt with that. Great question. Um. I was in the same place you were um, coming out of SVA. SVA has great resources, and it's, it's like a creative playground. Um, I mean, so that's what that was one of my first goals coming out was obviously to pay the rent, but the second thing I really wanted was uh, to be able to afford a studio. And I realized that, ha I, I ch by the way, I tried having uh, a studio in my apartment at the same time, and it was really challenging because it's like splitting your brain in a way. You, you can't quite relax and work at the same time. It's just a lot of distractions at home. I think it's really important to have a separate space for it so you can, once you leave your home or your workplace or wherever it is, into your studio space, that's your realm to create, right? So once you create that foundation, you're able to really produce great work and start to do that. Um, so I started out, uh, once I got my first full-time job as an all-purpose designer, I uh, had a small studio space, it was probably like four by five feet, it was tiny. And I was used to painting in a 25 by 30 foot studio at SVA <laughs> and it was wonderful. Um, so I had to scale my paintings down. I waited uh, maybe like a year and a half until I can get my first promotion. And I knew that immediately after I got that promotion, I was going to budget a portion of it to upgrade my studio. and. I knew that it wasn't going to happen immediately, so I waited and waited and waited until, you know, for probably three years until I was able to upgrade. And now I have this wonderful 20 foot by 20 foot studio, um, half wood working shop where I get to build my frames from scratch, stretch them and gesso them and, and then paint all I want. I get to paint, uh, pour paint on the floor if I want to. I don't have to worry about it. You know, it's solid concrete studio. Um, but yeah, I mean, it It didn't happen overnight. I knew that I wanted that. That was my priority, so I made it happen. I was gonna say, I've had <clears throat> um, a studio in New York when I first, you know, I moved here in 2000, had a studio for a little while, but once my, you know, life changes, you get married, I have two kids, and I was initially really scared about the idea of losing my studio space and being home and, would having a family and taking care of kids, you know, take away my creative self. And the opposite happened. Being home opened up new ideas. I started drawing on the walls. That led to opportunities that I didn't even know existed. And I grew to love just having a little desk, <clears throat> sometimes in my living room, sometimes I would move it into my bedroom. It was all one world and then I, was able to get a studio again. I got a beautiful space in Chelsea. I hated it. I didn't want the big studio. I felt uh, disconnected. So it's very weird. You know, I had this idea that I want this big studio in this space, and it wasn't. It wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And now I love working at home, and it's kind of strange. It's strange. I think because I had a studio. You know, when I was in grad school in Baltimore, I had the big studio, messy paint, and I. You think you want these things, but it, it's okay to know that different times of your life you're gonna have different spaces and different things that feel good. And it's okay to just have a little desk or whatever that nook can be for you. It's, you can still make great work. Yeah, and there was a time where I sacrificed an apartment for my studio and just moved into my studio and had a gym membership and that's how I showered and stuff. That's a rough way to live and I still have friends that do that. Um, <laughs> but coming out of grad school, we just all got a studio together and we shared and I feel like 
sharing a space is an easy way to cut down on cost, and you can even you know schedule time so you can be there by yourself and vary it a little bit. But it just depends on where you feel most creative, if it's outside of your home or if it's inside. So, I love working at home. Mm -hmm. It really is fan it's fantastic working at home. I highly recommend it. <laughs> Don't have to shower. <laughs> you just go from one room to the next, you know, get food. It's wonderful. <laughs> I really yeah. think it depends on the medium you're working with. Totally. Oh, yeah. Um, like I'm if you're working with turpentine and volatile paints, Chemicals, you might work. want to keep it separate from your kitchen. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Any other questions from the audience tonight? Well, I was going to yeah, add to that yeah, so quickly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really quick. Uh, oh, is that okay? Yeah, Are of course. No, no, um, no. I, I have a shared workspace that I think is fantastic because I can't work at home and I watch Netflix when I'm at home. So that's what I do there. <laughs> so, you know, I have a shared workspace, which is awesome because you're constantly around people who are moving and shaking and that inspires me. Right. So, just for a second. Great point. Oh, hi. Question here. <laughs> Great. Uh, so you've been told that to be successful, it's more important who you know than the skills you have. Is that essentially what you're what you're saying? And you're asking, is this is this true? How would you all respond to this I, question? I, I think it falls in there. I, I don't think it's everything, but it's certainly I think part it's of it. 50 yeah. 50. Mm. yeah. There. Yeah. I mean, you have to have skills because if you get the job and you have this great opportunity, you have to be able to deliver and you have to be able to do great work, but combination of having those opportunities and some luck, right? Yeah, I think there's a relationship between the fact that information is easily accessible now and the fact that there are fewer people who are famous after they're dead. Um, so I think you can, you can definitely put those pieces together a little bit and the more that you're out there, I think that's, that's, that's gonna service you. Um, so obviously who you know is gonna help in some capacity, but I mean, it can also be people's detriment because then you have in influences and then you're not really putting yourself out there anymore. So it's kind of like, you know, it goes both ways. Well, I, I think part of that is also having mentors as well, especially if you're n a newbie and you're coming up, having that one particular professor that's going to the parties that you're going to as well and introducing you around and all that sort of stuff. I think that's... That's part of networking, but it's you know also who you know, like contacting who um, could you know maybe help you further your career or something to that effect. Yeah. But also, what I realize is nobody's going to come up and say this is your dream job. Like nobody, yeah. you know, you th like everything that's yes. happened. I said, I want to draw on your walls. I see this is empty here. Like I want to do this. Nobody has ever come up to me and said, here's this amazing opportunity. Here you go. It's here for you. Not once, ever. So, you know, you have to ask for it and say, this is what I want to do. And I sent so many emails, like between 2002 when I got out of SVA, it wasn't until around 2010, I think, that I got something really happening. I sent so many emails out, so many, hey, look at this, hey, look at that, nothing, 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 nothing. You know, there's a lot of that, a lot of, I want to do this, can I do this, and mostly no's. And then it's just that passion and that love for, I can't do anything else. This is what I love to do. And you just keep doing it. Great. Thank you all so much. This has um, been a real pleasure having you here for this panel. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to our audience. Thanks for coming out in the rain. In the rain. <laughs>